And finally, turning in our Bibles to the book of Hebrews, or the, or the, or the letter to the Hebrews, the epistle to the Hebrews, chapter 13, uh, the final chapter, not the final sermon, but the final chapter, okay, chapter 13, uh, 1 through 19 this morning. We're going to look at this big section here, 1 through 19, Hebrews 13, uh, 1 through 19. Let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. For thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Remember those who are in prison as though in prison with them, and those who are mistreated, since you also <clears throat> are in the body. Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Keep your life free from love of money, and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their faith, uh, of their, their way of life, and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings. For it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods, which have not benefited those devoted to them. We have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy places by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. Through him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share, with, to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls, as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Pray for us. For we are sure that we have a clear conscience, desiring to act honorably in all things. I urge you the more earnestly to do this, in order that I may be restored to you the sooner. And all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. Well, something we're all learning uh, during this time is uh, what, it, what it feels like to be in exile. Um, our rights have been suspended. Is that the technical term for it? Our rights have been suspended. Um, can't meet, um, not supposed to meet in public, right? Um, or in private, I guess. Uh, we don't even have a, uh, we don't have a building, even if we wanted to meet uh, in a building, we don't have one, so we feel like exiles. Uh, we all are isolated in our homes and, uh, neighborhoods and areas <laughs> this week. Um, we're exiles. We're exiles, and so, you know, this is teaching us something of what that means, something of what that looks like. Um, so were our forefathers, we, we might want to remember, okay? So to encourage us, our forefathers uh, in the Old Testament, we saw in Hebrews 11, they were exiles, right? They were, they were wandering around in tents, a father Abraham not having a city, but looking for a city to come. Uh, they were exiles. Uh, our forefathers and foremothers we've seen. And, and back in chapter 3 and 4 as well, for example, uh, if you go back there and if you just notice there, and maybe go back and read it again, uh, in chapter 3, uh, verse 7 through chapter 4, roughly, uh, he, he used this image of the wilderness wandering generation uh, as an analogy for us today and for them in the first century, uh, describing to them that they were like those in the wilderness. Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts and so forth. Um, uh, and, and so there's a promise of entering the rest, right? They were in the wilderness and the promise of entering the promised land. Uh, that rest still stands. Let us uh, enter. Let us not, uh, uh, let us fear, lest any of you seem to have failed to reach it, chapter 4, verse 1 says. So we're exiles. Our forefathers were exiles. Our foremothers were exiles. Uh, and we're learning that. And it's good for us to learn that. Um, it's not just to be uh, sympathetic, which is to have um, feelings and passions where you come alongside somebody in their suffering uh, and their struggles. Uh, but this, also, this time also helps us to learn some empathy 
um, to, to have the same feelings, to have the same struggles, the same sufferings, uh, to have the same sense of passion uh, for good or for bad uh, during this time, as many brothers and sisters uh, today have, uh, uh, as exiles, as strangers. I just saw uh, the Chinese government is arresting churches that are live streaming church uh, service now. Uh, so if you use Zoom, they're tracking them through Zoom now. Uh, not only can they not meet in public, but now they can't even do what we're doing uh, in a living room uh, using technology to record sermons uh, and to put it out. So this teaches us some empathy uh, that what it, what it means to be an exile. Um, and so with that in mind, uh, as exiles, we see that uh, again here in chapter 13 of Hebrews, uh, that the Christian church is a people who, uh, who are exiles, who are strangers, uh, whose uh, uh, the world is not our home, uh, ultimately. Uh, uh, a new creation is, our, is going to be our home, but this world as it exists now is not our home. Our, our home is a city that is to come, a place wherein righteousness dwells. And so we come to Hebrews again, uh, the, the final chapter here, chapter 13, and to remind us that Jesus is better, um, uh, now he's telling us how we should live. So Jesus is better. Uh, we've seen that already. And because he's better, because he's worth it, how should we live? How should we live? So we left off two Sundays ago in chapter 12, the very, very end there, verse 28. Uh, Therefore, let us be grateful. Let us be grateful. We are already citizens of a kingdom uh, who has a king, Jesus. We are already citizens of this eternal kingdom uh, with our everlasting king. uh, And this kingdom cannot be shaken, he's been telling us. Therefore, let us be grateful. Let us be grateful. We may have rights suspended. We may not have a place to meet in public. We might all be isolated. Uh, We might be feeling a sense of sympathy as well as empathy uh, with those in the world around us today. But let us be grateful, he says. But let us be grateful. Well, how do we do that? Uh, How do we show gratitude uh, living in a world that uh, it's as plain as day uh, doesn't really care much about Jesus and the Christian church? How do we do that? That's what our text tells us to do. So just like many, many of the New Testament letters, they end up with exhortation. You know, here's now how we should then live. Um, notice there are three things. So uh, living in exiles, this life of living as exiles, because we have, a, have an everlasting kingdom, because we belong to that kingdom as citizens, and we have a king, Jesus, how do we show gratitude uh, in that kingdom? First of all, He tells us to to live a life of love. That's in the first six verses there. Uh, A life of love. And uh, verse one really is sort of a heading uh, for the whole when he says, let brotherly love continue. And you you probably know there's various Greek words for love. This is Philadelphia. Uh, This is the, the, uh, might be translated as mutual love. We typically think of it as brotherly love, right? Philadelphia is the city of? Brotherly love, right? Why? Because it's Philadelphia, right? That's, That's what Philadelphia is. Um, but more in general, mutual love. Yes, yeah, I, don't, I don't know how much brotherly love you know, might be found in the streets of Philadelphia, but I'm sure there's lots, uh, just like anywhere else, right? Um, but uh, uh, it's a mutual love. It's a mutual love. Uh, and this is, this is what he said earlier in chapter 6, verse 10, uh, when, when he said, uh, the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints. So the, the love that we show in serving the saints, one another, that's a love that we have for Jesus. That's a, that's a Philadelphia love. Uh, it's a mutual love that we would have one for another. Um, that we are our brother's keeper. Uh, we are brothers. We are family. That's what it is, a mutual familial love. Um, and so kids, my kids here, kids maybe watching, um, have you ever gotten into a fight with your brother or sister? Probably never, right? Never? Sadie, never got into a fight, right? Mm-hmm. You have a sad face right now, so it looks like you just got into a fight. Okay. Um, have you ever gotten into a fight with a brother or sister? Okay. So, yes. Yes. Do you still love your brothers? I see a, like, a, like, a, like a circular yes. Okay. <laughs> Head shake. Okay. But why? Why do you still love Cyprian? Why do you still love Caden? Why do you still love Daxon? Because they're your brothers, right? They're part of the family, right? 
So even in family, we have, we have squabbles and quarrels and fights and disagreements and family drama, right? I mean, we all, we all know the family drama, right? We all have it. Um, he says, let this love continue, even in the family, right? Even in the family, this, this Philadelphia love, this mutual love. Well, well, how do I express this mutual love? How can we, uh, as a body of believers, as a church family, express this brotherly mutual love? Well, first of all, he says you can do so towards strangers. Notice verses 2 through 6 really is sort of explaining then in practical ways uh, this brotherly love towards strangers. Don't neglect to show hospitality to strangers. Don't neglect to show hospitality uh, to strangers. Um, hospitality to strangers. It's one Greek word, philoxenia, which, which, which means love of those who are different. Love of strangers. Uh, right? We hear a lot in the news about xenophobia, right? Xenos means different, strange. It's the, it's the fear of others, right? The fear of, of those who are different. Uh, philoxenia is a love, right? So Philadelphia has the, has the same root of love uh, towards strangers. Uh, so don't neglect to show hospitality to strangers. That, that's one way that we can show mutual brotherly love. Now in the first century, hospitality was required. I mentioned this a couple of Sunday nights ago. Um, I think it was Acts 14-ish or so, uh, where Paul and Barnabas were in Lystra, and they were preaching, and then the, the crowds came, and they started to sacrifice animals because they said that the gods came down, Zeus and Hermes. Why? Because I mentioned there's an old, old ancient Greek poem uh, by a poet named uh, Ovid who said in this poem that in that very region of the ancient world, the gods came down a long, long time ago, and they went to every house in the region, and everybody closed their door, except for this poor couple that lived in a little, like, thatch roof, uh, like a house made out of straw. And they became rich. Everybody else died in a flood. That's because the culture of the first century required that if a stranger knocked on your door, you had to welcome them in and show them hospitality. Take their shoes off. Take their coat off. Uh, give them uh, water to wash their feet. Give them water to drink. Wine even to drink. Uh, give them food. And you didn't ask them who they were, what their name was, where they're coming from, what they're doing, until after all that. We're the opposite, right? The door, the door of our rings. We look through our peephole. Right? Uh, if it's not, if it's not a, a, a Girl Scout selling me Samoas or Thin Mints, I'm not opening the door, right? <laughs> okay, we like, we're, 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 we're skeptical, we're, we scrutinize. You know, we see you got the clipboard, like, ah, it's a salesman. Um, see someone else, you know, ah, I don't wanna answer the door right now. You know, don't, don't bother me. Um, it was a requirement to show hospitality. And that meant it was expensive because you have to give your food and your drink and your stuff to them. It was also dangerous. Is also dangerous because obviously you don't know who this person is, right? They, they could be there because they're just passing through, because maybe they're a family member extended and they've traveled far and wide, and they might have been there to murder you for all you know. They might have a dagger in their in their cloak. It was a dangerous thing, but it was required. Uh, and the New Testament tells us, as believers, it's a requirement for us to seek to show hospitality, Romans 12 tells us. Uh, 1 Peter 4, verse 9 says to do this without grumbling. To do it without grumbling. So uh, we are to, to show mutual love and a brotherly affection uh, by, by showing hospitality. Why? Because he tells us, because by, uh, thereby some have entertained angels unawares. And this goes all the way back to Genesis. This is the story of, of Abraham uh, where he's in his tent with his wife and these three strangers show up. These three angels show up uh, and they show hospitality. They, they give them meat. They give them uh, drink. They provide for them in this those angels then told them why they were there, right? They're bringing, they're bringing judgment upon Sodom and Gomorrah. And when they went to Sodom and Gomorrah, how did the, Sod how did the Sodomites and the Gomorrahites treat the strangers? Mm. Not well. No. <laughs> no. Not well, right? The opposite of how Abraham and Sarah treated them. So seek to show hospitality, okay? Don't be a Sodomite. Don't be a Gomorrahite. Be a Christian, right? Love. Because you never know uh, who it is you're welcoming into your home. We also should show this very love, uh, verse 3, to, strain, uh, to, uh, to prisoners. Remember, those who are in prison as though in prison with them. Right? So that's, uh, that's empathy, right? To, as, this, as if you were with them. Um, and those who are mistreated since you also are in the body. So those who are mistreated physically, you also have a body. Right? Empathize with them. 
And again, in the first century, if you were a prisoner, um, you know, you go to jail now, they give you, they take your clothes, but they give you clothes in exchange for those clothes that you have. Uh, what else do they give you in, in jail? Food. What else? Water, right? What else? A bathroom. What else? Workout room. A place to work out, right? Rights. Okay, certain time of the day to do this and that. Food and drink, okay, in, in particular. And what if you get sick in, in jail? Infirmary. And nowadays you get let out, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> nowadays you get, you get a free pass, you know? Um, so in the first century, if you were a prisoner, no food, no water, you know, no help, no health care. Unless someone else that you loved and knew came to the jail, the prison, the, the dungeon, right? The hole in the ground, the cave, and brought those things to you. And in the first century, uh, as the Christian faith begins to, uh, 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 to spread across the ancient world, who was known for visiting prisoners, you think? Christians. Christians. They were known for, for, for visiting prisoners and making converts in prison. I mean, this is the Apostle Paul sings, and a guy is converted, uh, a jailer is converted uh, in prison. So um, Christians, we are to be empathetic as though in prison. Uh, and we are to be empathetic for those who are mistreated because we too are in a body that suffers as well. Let us show love. Notice as well within marriage, verse 4, let marriage be held in honor among all. Uh, notice the language of honor because it's God's institution, right? We honor the marriage institution as God has commanded us and as God has defined it. And the very opening of the Bible, Genesis 1 and 2, that's how important it is. God makes the world, he institutes marriage. He institutes work as well, right? He institutes... Uh, uh, care for the creation and so forth. Uh, we are to to uh, to hold marriage in honor among all. Let the marriage bed be undefiled. Right. That's a way of saying that all immorality. Uh, the, the language that's used here is speaks of uh, uh, all immorality uh, is prohibited. It is to be a, a holy, sanctified state uh, of marriage. Why? Because God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Sounds kind of strict, doesn't it? Sounds kind of harsh. But doesn't God say that? Mm -hmm. Doesn't Paul say in 1 Corinthians 6? Uh, um, well, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9. Let me just read that. I thought I had it memorized. Now it's escaping me. Oh, there we go. Or do you not, or do you not know uh, that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God well, who, who does he define as the unrighteous? The sexually immoral, idolaters, adulterers, and so forth. Those who practice homosexuality, thieves, greed, drunkards, revilers, swindlers. None of them will inherit the kingdom of God. Does that mean you can't be a sinner? That, that you've got to clean up your act first to go to heaven? No, no, that's what he says next. And such were some of you. But you were washed, sanctified, justified in the name of Jesus by the Spirit of God. Those whose lives are characterized and are taken up and are dominated and driven by these sorts of things, will not inherit God's kingdom. In other words, they, these are the unrepentant. Those who, uh, who once were these things, but now are Christians, that's our identity as Christian, not anything else. Right? That's our identity. Not Republican, Democrat, right? Straight, gay. Like the, everyone wants to have an identity today. We're Christians. We're Christians. Let the marriage bed be held in honor. Notice also with, with money, verses 5 and 6. Uh, another way to show love is with your money. Keep your, your life free from the love of money. That's the negative way of saying it, the positives. And be content with what you have. Is money evil? No. no. Is money evil? No. no? What's evil? About the love, of money. the love of money, right? The love of money is evil. Okay? God has told us, all taught his word, that if we work, we, we get the product of our work, right? You work a field, you get literal produce, right? The literal product of your field. Uh, if you work hard and you get a paycheck and you invest that money and you, and you reap the reward of that, that's the fruit of your labor, right? It's not the love of money, or it's not, it's not money, but it's the love of money. It's, and it's you, as Christians, it's using our money uh, not for evil, but for good. And so he says, be content, with what you have. Don't be driven in with greed, right? Uh, don't be like Gordon Gecko. You know who that is? Gordon yeah. Gecko, right? Wall Street. 
Well, the movie Wall Street, right? Right? Greed is good, right? Yeah. Wasn't that Michael, was that Michael Douglas? Yeah. Right? Michael Douglas? Yeah. yeah. Greed is good, right? No, don't be, don't be a Gordon Gecko, okay? <laughs> what a great name for a, for a character, anyway, Gordon Gecko. Um, keep your life free from the love of money. That, that's greed, right? Avarice is an old term for that, right? Uh, be content with what you have. Don't, uh, your life shouldn't be driven by the love of money, but by the love of others, right? This brotherly love. Why? Because God has said, I won't leave you or forsake you. You don't need to love money. God's going to provide for you. God's presence, notice that, his presence is amongst you. And then secondly, that's why we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? So why should I be content with what God has given me? Because he is, he is present with me and because he protects me. Okay? He's present amongst me and he protects me. So in sum, we, we should... We should show that we are citizens of an unshakable kingdom by expressing love in all areas of life. And these are just various examples of life. Okay, so how am I to be grateful as a citizen of Jesus Christ, unshakable kingdom? Showing love. Showing love in every area of my life. Love for God, love for neighbor. And by showing love to neighbor, you're showing love to God. Notice, secondly, it's a life in the word. A life in the word, verses 7 through 17. It might seem like a sort of a strange, you know, uh, this chapter might seem strange to us. It might seem like it's sort of haphazard. It's just a random list of, you know, quick final thoughts, you know, be before he finishes. But it has a structure to it. Notice verse 7. Um, remember your leaders, those who spoke in the past, this is the past tense, those who spoke to you the word of God, uh, those who established your faith. So he's telling these Christians in particular in the first century, Right? They're being tempted to leave Jesus and go back to the, t to the synagogue. Don't forget those who originally preached the gospel to you. Don't forget them. They established your faith. Uh, and then he focuses here on their lives, uh, these leaders. Consider, he says to, to us, consider the outcome of those who spoke the word, the outcome of their way of life, and imitate uh, their faith. So think about those who preached to you the word. Um, consider the, the outcome of their way of life, imitate their faith. Um, so before all this happened, I think it was like a month before all this happened, Cyprian and I went to a uh, basketball game, college basketball game, uh, my alma mater, and um, we were in a, in a little VIP like alumni room, because it was an alumni game, and Cyprian was just hogging down like a ton of hot dogs, <laughs> <laughs> as, as Cyprian's known to do. And I had my back to sit, talking to somebody. And then I heard this voice. Cyprian was talking to somebody. And I turned around. And it was, it was uh, Kara Jean and my, our pastor while we were in college. Um, and uh, Pastor Mike. And was like, I know that voice. I haven't heard that voice in 20 plus years. And he was talking to Cyprian of all people. You know, in God's providence. So, um, you know, uh, just he's a godly man. Uh, uh, a man that just always showed love. Always, uh, every Sunday was like, at the front door, you know, always shaking hands, smiling, hugging people, um, just, uh, just a great person. Um, think about those who preach the word to you, uh, whether you agreed with all the words they said or not. Consider the outcome of their way of life. Uh, imitate their faith. Um, and he was also recruiting my son for basketball, but that's, that's neither here nor there. So um, <laughs> He's the president now of, 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 the, of, the, of the university, so uh, he was putting a good word in for the university. Um, so... A life in the word. Remember those who preach the word. And you consider their, their way of life. You consider their faith. Imitate it. Uh, and then what seems out of place is verse 8. Uh, those of us who come through uh, the doors of the Foursquare Church know this verse. This is the, this is the, the theme verse uh, for the International Church of the Foursquare Gospel. Jesus Christ is the same today, yesterday, and forever. Anybody Know those words, right? I mean, every Foursquare church has those words somewhere on the wall uh, or on the door, somewhere painted, posted up in prominent view uh, of everybody. So what is he saying there? Well, he's saying this, that you heard the word from these preachers in the past. They established your faith. Uh, now you're being tempted to leave that faith. But don't forget Jesus. The same Jesus you heard back then is the same Jesus today. And he'll always be the same. Towards you, Although your leaders have died, who's alive? Jesus. That's what he's saying. Okay, Because again, it's a past tense. Those who spoke to you the word of God, most likely, potentially, they have died. 
uh, but Jesus is alive. So just because you're, you're, you're uh, the, the apostle, the preacher, the missionary who came and brought the gospel, because just because he's died doesn't mean that, he's, that, that you've been left. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So he says there uh, to them, to us, to remember uh, your leaders. That's what the outline says. Remember. Uh, where's my outline? There it is. So remember the lives of your preachers, verse 7. Uh, verse number 8, uh, notice he says there, secondly, uh, verse, uh, verse 9 through 16, receive their teaching. Okay, so remember them, receive their teaching. And again, the, these verses seem like a weird digression in the middle of all these exhortations, but he's reminding them of all that he said. You know, what was it that those who spoke the word of God to you in the past said? That you're now being tempted to leave. What was it? What's the big theme of the book, Caden? What is Hebrews all about? Uh, Jesus, is greater. Jesus is greater. Good. Jesus is better, right? Jesus is, uh, is, is, is great, uh, better. He's the best. So that's what these verses are saying. Okay? That's what they're saying. Do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings. That's a negative. Like positively, what's he saying? So when he says, don't be led away by strange and diverse teaching, what, what is he? What is he saying? Truth. Yeah, commit yourself to the truth, right? Right? So don't be led away by diverse and strange teachings. Uh, for it's good for the heart to be strengthened by grace. Now notice the contrast here. Grace, not by foods, which have not benefited those who, uh, 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 those devoted to them. So, yes, he's speaking here of the old covenant uh, Jewish kosher food laws. Okay? Um but not merely just kosher Old Testament food laws, but those are a part for the whole. The, the, the whole of God's uh, ceremonial laws in the Old Testament is what he's saying. Because remember what he's been telling them multiple times, uh, chapter 7, verse number 9 encapsulates it when he says, the law made nothing perfect. He doesn't mean the Ten Commandments. He doesn't mean God's law is not good. No, he's saying that the ceremonial laws like sacrifices and priests and holy places like temples and even food laws, by devoting yourself to those things, they don't perfect you. They don't consecrate you to serve God rightly because they were never meant to. They were only meant to point us to Jesus, to the reality of them. And so they've not benefited those devoted to them. So you should have your heart strengthened by grace, not by the ceremonial laws, okay? Okay. By grace, not by uh, the ceremonial laws. We have an altar from which those who serve the tent, he's speaking about the, the priests in the actual temple right then and there. We have an altar from which those who serve the tent, the priests, have no right to eat. Where is that altar? In heaven, right? So the whole of Hebrews has been telling us, right? Jesus sacrificed himself. Uh, poured out his blood in the on the upon the in, in the heavenly tent upon the heavenly altar to sanctify heavenly things. Okay, so we have an altar in heaven. Those who serve an earthly altar, they, they can't eat of that altar, right? Because you would bring sacrifice to the priest in the Old Testament. He would he would flay it up, fillet it up, you know, burn it up, and then you would eat part of it. Okay, but we have an altar. They can't eat. They can't eat from that altar. Only we can. For the bodies of those animals whose blood was brought into the holy places, again, the earthly place, the temple, by the high priest as they sacrifice for sin, are burned outside the camp. So this is the Day of Atonement ritual. There would be animal sacrifice, and then part of it was uh, given to God and, and on, the, on the altar, and then part of it was taken outside the camp to be burned up. It was symbolic of right, sin and impurity being cleansed out of the holy tent. And then he makes his application. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people uh, through his own blood. So Jesus was given, or was crucified outside the gates of Jerusalem upon uh, Calvary or Golgotha uh, to sanctify us. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. So they're being... So these Christians were being tested and tempted to, as it were, you know, to come back into Jerusalem, back into the synagogues where it was safe, where they would be welcomed, they would have a place, and so forth. 
But the writer says, you know, let's go to Jesus outside. Let's go to him outside. That might sound, it, it should sound familiar to what he's been telling us. Look in chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Those famous, those famous words. Uh, Since we're surrounded by such great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight, the sin that clings so easily to us. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. How? What does verse 2 say again? Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him did what? Endured Endured the the cross, despising the shame and so forth. He's telling us to do the same thing again. Let's go outside the camp with Jesus, looking to him who died and suffered for us outside the camp. And although it's painful and it's hard and it's harsh and it's difficult, let us go with Jesus. Why? Because, verse 14, or here, uh, for here we do not have a lasting city. We seek the city that is to come. Chapter 11 again. Father Abraham and so forth. And through Jesus, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise. So, We also sacrifice as priests, but notice what our sacrifice is. The fruit of our lips that acknowledge Jesus' name. Confessing Jesus is a sacrifice of praise. Do not neglect to do good, to share what you have, right? Don't love money. Be content and use what God has given you. Because with such sacrifices, the sacrifices of praise, so notice there's praise, there's acknowledging God, praising God. There's also loving neighbor as self by doing good to them. These are called sacrifices that are pleasing to God. So how do I uh, show a life of gratitude to God for having an everlasting kingdom? It's by showing love to, uh, uh, mutual love to one another. It's by living a life of love. It's by living a life that's devoted to the word. Uh, And notice how verse 17 brings us full circle back to verse 7, this section kind of, nicely uh, begins and ends when he says, obey your leaders, submit to them. Uh, Why? Because they're watching out for your souls. They have to give an account. Let them do this with joy, not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. So we are to show a life of love. We are to demonstrate a life of the word by remembering the words we've heard, uh, by receiving their teaching, by respecting their oversight. Those who lead and who guide and who preach the word. Why? Because it's beneficial to do that. It's good for our souls to do that. Okay. Notice thirdly, he says, uh, verses 18 and 19, uh, a life of gratitude because of this kingdom is a life of prayer. It's a life of prayer. Um, pray for us, he says. Pray for us. You see this in Paul's letters. Um, it's one of the reasons why Hebrews may have been written by Paul. Uh, Because it ends, it sounds very similar to Paul. Um, The letters of the New Testament typically end with some call to prayer. Pray for us. Uh, For we are sure that we have a clear conscience, desiring to act honorably in all things. So he's speaking here of this context of this uh, this Jewish persecution. Uh, I urge you the more earnestly to do this. To do what? Pray, right? To pray. Why? in order that I may be restored to you the sooner. So this preacher, whoever it is, is no longer with them and now is uh, is uh, is, is calling upon them to pray so that he will be restored to them, to be brought back to them somehow. So again, maybe it may have been Paul in prison, right? Looking and longing to get back uh, for, uh, for, for more service and ministry. But it's a life of prayer. And in particular, it's a, it's a life of prayer that, uh, and we see this in Paul's letters, like in, in Ephesians 6, when he says, pray for us uh, that a door would be opened to, to, to preach the word. And he's saying the same thing here. So it's a life of prayer. And we are to pray for all the things that we're commanded to pray for. The Lord's Prayer is a great example of that. In particular, to pray that God would use the word uh, to conquer people's hearts, to transform their lives, to change their minds, uh, to give them uh, openness to receive the gospel. Uh, in, a, in a time like this, uh, it's just even more pressing for us uh, to be praying, uh, not that people can you know, dive back into their uh, stock market investments because everything will be back open. That's important for people to work and so forth, but to pray that God would use this time to, to bring people to him, uh, to bring people to himself, that he might be praised and honored. And so... Uh, We're learning this time to be exiles. I hope you're sensing something of that here in our text as well. 
what it looks like to be exiles. Uh, let's be a church and a family that loves, uh, that's devoted to the word, and that prays. Um, on the one hand, there's a lot of great stuff here. On the other hand, it's not, there's nothing new here, right? Mm -hmm. This is the same call to action we get all throughout the New Testament, to love, uh, to be in the Word, and to pray. So let's do that. Let's pray.